James. I didn't know. I got fired up so many ways before church tonight. I'm going to say two or three things. We're in James 1, the 26th verse. James 1, 26. Did you see any of the Thompson's word that they're in trial now over our uh, place to allegiance under God? Have y'all seen that today? Oh, yes. Made me more acute. They're wanting to take it out because it's infringing on the atheist rights. Now you say, well, they won't ever do that. Well, with Madeline O'Hara, one woman got prayer out of school. You know why? Because all of us Christians said, that'll never happen. You know, it did happen. Growing up, if you went into court and you were a witness, you got on the witness stand, you took your Bible, put your left hand on it, raised your right hand, and you said that you swore to God to tell the truth. <coughs> That's when God meant something. God doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not Obamacare that's destroying America. It's not Obama that's destroying America. It's not the congressman and senate that's destroying America. It's not drugs that's destroying America. What is destroying America is that we have gotten so far away from God. Amen. Amen. This is what we stand on. I talked to him. I had a good day. I ran into a fellow this morning I've been praying for and witnessing to uh, at the store up here at Rudy's. He was coming down and he said, uh, he'd been, I've been after him for three months and praying, God, give me the opportunity, just the opportunity, just to talk to him. That's all I want. I'm not going to preach to him or jump on him. Here he comes and he said, what are you looking for? I told him, look for some screws. He, we found them. He said, what else are you looking for? I, I don't think I've ever been in Rudy's before that I remember. And so he found it, and I hugged him, and I went and paid for it. When I left, I threw my hand up at him, and you know what he did? He reached over and wrapped his arms around me and hugged me in front of about ten people and said, I love you, bro. Amen. Amen. Now, you think God ain't God? Now, before I left Rudy's, here come another fellow. I had been praying to talk to him. But I guess he'd been praying to talk to me. And so we shared some things together. And he said, well, I know what's going on down at church. And I said, I'm glad. I said, God is really moving. And I said, I've learned this, is to preach the word. That's all God called me to do and get out of the way and let God do his business. He said, now, it's got to be organized. He said, the, the Bible said everything got to be done decently in order. And I said, yes, it has. And this thing went on, and I seen I done lost control. I didn't have any control of the conversation. And uh, we, we, got, we got the church organized. So when I left there, I had this thought. I think it's three things. What has happened to the church is, number one, that we have programized God out of it. Amen. And we have no place on our bulletin or our agenda for God to work in the church. Right. And I asked this guy, I said, how many people have y'all had saved in the last five years? He said, we haven't had any. <laughs> I thought, why not program? Program. There's... Three things that keeps God from working in his body, in his fellowship. Number one is that we don't put him on the program. Every church that I ever pastored except for this one, we printed a bullet. The music director came in and it said, welcome. That was on the bullet. Welcome. So you knew you was welcome. I didn't have to say a word. Nobody else had to say a word. You could read it. That's on the program. Next thing it said, him, so-and-so, would you please stand? And it wrote down that. Everybody knew what to do. Seated. Announcements. And then two more songs. Offering. And then message. Time we got through that, 
We had about 15 minutes. And you know what I call that? A sermonette for Christianettes. <laughs> Don't want to preach long. So you programize God out. It's got to be done decently in order. So the Spirit of God never gets a chance to work. The second thing will cause it is sin. If I bring sin in my heart and bring it into the fellowship, and you bring sin in your heart and into the fellowship, we got a problem. Right. How many sins does it take to stop God from working? One. <laughs> you remember the Babylonian garment that was taken when Joshua was fighting the battle and he hid it in his tent, the Babylonian garment? What God do? He wiped that whole family out. They lost the battle. Why? Because sin. The only thing that stop us from going forward is that we get too programmed. I don't want that. That we allow sin into our lives. Now, friend, I'm not telling you that you're not going to sin, that I'm not going to sin. I'd be lying to you. But we don't have to let it dwell. Right now. You can take care of it. Give it to God, ask forgiveness of it, and it goes on. Now the next thing, Jesus said that he fed 5,000. And after that, he moved out. And it said that many did not follow him anymore. They went back and walked no more with him. <coughs> Why? Because a lot of them were there because of the loaves and the fishes. Now everybody, I wish to God that everybody comes through these doors and comes forward would stay. I wish to God that everyone that gets baptized and joins the church would stay. But if they didn't stay with Jesus, they're not all going to stay with us. Are you with me? Amen. So what do we do? Don't let that discourage you. Because the eye is on the prize. We just keep going and going and going and going. Amen. Energizer button. Not going to run down. Just going to keep on. So don't let those things bother you. If the devil can bother you, he'll whip you. And if he whips you, then it'll whip me. And when it whips me, I can't preach and you can't listen and we'll just sit here and look at each other. <laughs> <coughs> All right. That guy out there got me fired up today. Barbara, she got two or three doses of it. I, she'd go in the house and I'd follow her, and she'd come back out and I'd follow her. I thought I had it out of the system, but I didn't. Now, in James 1 and 26, we have been studying how that we get saved, God begins to shape us, and when He begins to shape us and use us, the devil comes along and He begins to test us to do sin. If we sin, and if we allow Him to take that part and go that far with us, then that's not a God. That's of the devil. All it takes is repenting of it, asking God to forgive you. You back up and you back going again and you're going to doing those things that God wants you to do. Every good gift that comes into this world comes from above. It comes from the Father of lights. And then last week we talked about that following in the in the pathways of righteousness, it's like it said, look into the perfect law of liberty. He compared it to this. He said, if you look in a mirror, you can see your reflection of who and what you are. And as long as you look into that, you know who you are and what you are physically. But then he says, he said that to say this. He said that we ought to look into the perfect law of liberty. Now, the perfect law of liberty is Jesus Christ. He saved you. As long as you stay in the book, as long as you keep your prayer life caught up, and as long as you attend the fellowship, and you say, well, I'll just come to church when I want to. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But let me tell you this. You'll get cold. You'll get indifferent. You'll get to where you don't care. And you'll finally just pull up stakes and say, <laughs> The devil with that, I'm going to do something else. And that's why it's important Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, because I promise you this, I'll make, I made a vow to God and I'll make a vow to you. If you come 
and you bring somebody with you, I won't pussyfoot around with it. I'll preach the Word. I'll teach the Word. Not me, but God through me, and I'll just use the book and not give you any vain repetitions of anything. Just the book. All right, now we're down to the 26th verse. If any man among you seems to be religious. Now this is great. What is a religious person? He's a person that has the outward appearance of being good. Being right. He'll come to church. He'll never be offensive to anyone. He'll be kind. He'll be sweet or she. They'll know the right things to say and do the right things outwardly in their appearance. Now if any of you, and I put myself at the head of the line in this county, personify and assume to have this kind of appearance, then they're considered a religious person. I ran into a guy in Paducah the other day, and he is of a different denomination. This is what he said. He said, I am not of your faith. And that startled me. What he meant to say is that I'm a Methodist and you're a Baptist. He couldn't, he couldn't or he should not have said, I am not of your faith. Because there's just one faith, one Lord, one God, Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So if he attends a Methodist church and I attend a Baptist church, that don't mean that we don't worship the same God. We're all the children of God that have been born again of his Spirit. We may differ in things that we think the Bible said. That's all right. I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Barbara said she knew she was right. One thing we don't talk about, we t I know her, what she believes and she knows what I believe, but what she don't believe, I don't talk about. <laughs> and what I don't believe, she don't talk about. And so we can agree, and we just have a good time. Every once in a while, I give her a sneak punch. <laughs> See if I can get something in there. Show her something new in the Bible. I hadn't tricked her yet. I still can't convince her I'm right. <laughs> you ever feel that way? Amen. Do you ever feel that I'm right? If you do, you're treading on thin ice. None of us are right. God's right. We may not understand. Down through the years, my interpretation of the Bible has changed as I have grown. Things that I saw a year ago, I thought was that way. As God opened my eyes more today, I see a more light. I see further down the road. I have not changed and will not change. And you must be born again. I will not change in the cross, the blood, the death, burial, resurrection, the ascension of Christ. Those things are that. But God has opened my heart and my eyes to learn, learn. This, is, this book is a well with no end. So if any among you seems to be religious, this is how you can tell. And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Now what does it mean? Now, over in James, we're going to deal with long tongues and bridling the tongue. And I didn't understand this for a long time. What does it mean for a man to be religious, and if he doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is vain? What does that mean? Okay. Somebody else. Okay. That's what a bridle does to the horse. Keeps yeah, but what if you lose loose rank? You can bid him. You can bid him. I trained horses for a lot of years. And you every horse requires a different kind of bid. Now a horse has two sets of teeth. 
they've got their biters that come from here to about here. And then their chewers start up here and go all the way up to where their eyeballs are. Now you have to do some things to those horses every year. You have to, first of all, when they're coming two-year-old, you've got to pull their wolf teeth. Did you know that? Their wolf teeth is at the back, on the bottom of their biters. And you can put a bit in a horse's mouth that's never had his wolf teeth pulled, and if that bit touches that the wolf teeth, it's like you taking, uh, if you, you ever had a quickie tooth, it's like me taking a wire and sticking it down that quickie tooth. Those wolf teeth, man, you'll see horses. Have you seen horses in the past slam their heads and bite it? That's what's wrong. they got wolf teeth. And then you have to float a horse's teeth. A horse's teeth is not like ours. They continually grow all the time. Now, how do you float them? Well, they make a set of floats, different kinds of angles, but all it is is a fire. You get the horse by the tongue, hold the tongue out, put your fist up in his mouth, and you start just sawing. And it, it, it sounds just like what it is. It's But now when you get it right, it goes. You know, it's slick. You know it's right. Then you got to sculpture their teeth. After you get it flat, a horse's teeth don't work like ours do up and down. A horse's tooth, the top ones will come in and the bottom ones will go over. Now if you don't float those teeth, then the, the part of them that comes out, they'll get sharp and they'll get pointers on. And when they chew, those points on those teeth will go up into the jaws and cut them. Now, one of the ways you may have seen this if we're raised on a farm. Have you ever seen an old horse go over and eat some hay and then go over to the water and dunk it down in the water and then you think they're chewing it? They're not. They're chewing it, but they're not swallowing it. They take and they push that jaw out and they take their tongue and they pack it up in that jaw because their teeth are so sharp that gives them cushion. Getting education on horses. <laughs> now that bridle, that bridle that he's talking about is not what you put on a horse. It's what you say that you are. <coughs> has nothing to do with you out here committing any sin. But if a man seems to be religious, well, do you know how much I gave last Sunday? How much do you give? Well, I gave $300. I've seen what you give. You gave a quarter. <laughs> Starting to get it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to donate the carpet to this place. <laughs> what are you going to do? You don't have to tell anybody who and what you are. They already know. How do they know? Not by the... You tell them. Bridle that tongue. Keep it in your mouth. Shut up. Live the life. And then it's not vain. Vanity is something that glorifies you. And I know about being glorified. I tried to glorify myself the biggest part of my life. <coughs> How about you? <laughs> I like for everybody to know who Crow was. If you stand still long enough, I tell you. If you'd stand still a little longer, I'd tell you how good I was. You know what you call that? Somebody calls it stretching the truth. It's a flat out lie. They call it exaggerating. It's a flat out lie. You know who you are, but we will do these things in order to make ourselves look better to other people. So he says that you deceive your own self. Your religion is vain. Right on your tongue, don't tell people what you are. They can see it. 
Now he's 27th verse. Pure religion and none defiled before God and the Father is this. Now if you're going to be right with God, don't tell people who and what you are. This is what he says qualifies you as a religious person. Pure religion and defiled uh, before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless. <coughs> You said, well, that's the reason that uh, we've got foster care. Now, I want to show you. So many of the things that God commanded us to do, the government, and we voted for it through the years, we allowed them to come in and take the responsibility out of the church and place it into the government hands. Right. Now, I still, you may not, that's all right. I still believe what the Bible says, if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. Amen. Amen. <laughs> At Wickham, when I was growing up, I've seen kids get thrashed on the sidewalk. I've seen them get thrashed in the courthouse yard. In fact, in fact, I've been a participant in some of those things. <laughs> I got in front of the bank building one day. Right there at the four-way stop. <laughs> Didn't it, the people pass by, they just look and go on. Why? Because they'd, they'd get theirs on the other end. Well, we don't do that anymore. Dr. Spock came along and he said, it was time out. Here we go with the time out. <laughs> That's what that kid say. <laughs> then we say to him, now I'm going to tell your daddy. <laughs> I want, why don't you step up to the plate, Mom? <clears throat> tell him one time. One time. And then after that, let there be a result. It won't take too many times of having results until things will start working out. Now we get down to pleading with them. Oh, please, please, honey, don't do that anymore. <laughs> please, give mom a break. Give that, please. Say we got a little boy in here and he reared back and he throws and breaks the window. Oh, no. And we say to him, time out! Uh -huh. Sit down over there. He gets up. Did nothing happen. Gets him another rocks and windows go together with boys. <laughs> Slings at another one. And you please, honey, don't do that anymore. Please don't do that anymore. <laughs> He's going to continue. Let me tell you, this works. Will you let me take me a little keen switch or my belt and go over and get him by the hand and get him around his ankles and come up down. That's what they used to call dress it down. <laughs> and dress him down a one good time and say, now boy, that's just the start of it. When you do that again, things are really going to heat up around here. <laughs> now, what does a child do? I've never seen a child that got a whipping, got disciplined. They would cry, and the next thing they would do within one to two minutes, they'd turn around and they'd run to you, and they would love you. Man. Now, that never made sense to me. But God said, when you spare the rod, now I'm not talking about beating them unmerciful. I'm talking about discipline. Mr. Pfizer, when I was a senior, he bent me over his desk three licks or three days. Right time for the test semester exam, if I took three days, I wouldn't have passed. I told him, I said, bad as I hate to, I'm going to have to take it. He said, that's what I thought. And buddy, he three licks and he warmed it up on me. 
I was more careful about what I did next time and who in front of. What I'm talking about? Amen. Now you say, I don't know how I got off on this, but we're going. <laughs> if your children act out, where did they get that? They act out like they act at home. Whatever they say at home, they'll say out. Now when they get us out in public, that's embarrassing. Where did you hear that? How did you know to do that? They've been doing it all the time, but you had your head up in La La Land. Now everybody else is looking, and you're embarrassed. Wait till I get you home, I'm gonna wear you out. You're lying. <laughs> you're in the heat of passion. Got your dander up. And you take them home and you give them whatever they want. Just to get them to be quiet. Mm. I never could stand that myself. I remember and I'll go on. Tracy, we were out at Mother, she was a little bit. I was sitting on the couch, she did something, I said, you come here. She squatted down, she looked at me and said, what are you doing? I know. I think I ducked my head and laughed. She was she she wasn't very old, probably. She just started walking, started walking, I think, seven or eight months. And she wasn't much older than that. But I've never forgot that. Okay. We're going on the finish. Pure religion and the father before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and to visit the widows. Do you know any widows or widowers? Don't hold your hand. I'm sure you do. Have you ever visited them? Uh, four things I feel sorry for. That's about all we do. I can't go over there and stand to talk to them because it hurts my heart. Don't you think their hearts hurt? Don't you think that they need love? Don't you think that they need somebody just to talk with them, just to talk with them? Now he said if you got the real thing in your life, <coughs> keep your mouth shut and put it into action, visit the fatherless and visit the widows. Then he goes on to say you visit them in their afflictions. Now hold on. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have been to the nursing home and seen Adele one of our charter members since she has been in there. Well, I just hadn't had time. I would hate and you would hate to be put off somewhere where you couldn't care for yourself and nobody that said that everybody said they love you and no one came to see you. <laughs> Did you say something? Amen. Visit them in their affliction. We got a dear brother Paul that got saved and boy, God only knows what a miracle it was to get him baptized. Some of you will never know. You don't need to know. But buddy, it took an act. The Senate and Congress couldn't have got that done. But God did. And we got to baptize him. We all rejoiced in it. Now how many have gone by and paid him a visit? And said, Brother, we love you and praying for you. Now that's what he's talking about, the real thing. When you get the real thing, you will quit looking at what you want and you'll start seeing other people's needs. That's a real thing. That's when a church begins to sop down, take root, and begin to grow by functioning. I've been so self-centered all my life that all I, I could ever see was me, 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 me. I, 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 I. 
and I'm the only one in this building that has ever been there. <laughs> I am selfish. I promise you, you'll never hear another preacher say that. And I wouldn't have said it a few years ago, but I am. That's just honest God's truth, God. So pure religion, undefiled, visits the fathers, visits the widows and their afflictions, and then the last thing will we'll us. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Sin. If we, if our soul could be turned out, if the inner man could be turned out, our spiritual part, I'm afraid that many of us would look like a leper. That's that cat that's got spots on it. From Africa. You know what I'm talking about? He said, we don't want to be spotted up like the leper. We don't want to be spotted with sin. You know why? Because if it is, your religion is back. You won't, you won't want to do the things that's right. And you will make justification for the way that you live. Amen. Pure religion, undefiled before God. Is your religion vain or is it the real thing? Bow your heads with us. Father, we thank you for what you've given us. We thank you for your amazing grace, God. There's nothing in this world that we can do to cause ourselves to be righteous except by faith, trust you, ask you in our hearts, believe you. And God, when we do those things, we have your promise. If we confess our sins, you're faithful and just. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, I, I stand on that today because that's for me and for everyone here and for the entire <coughs> world. It works. Amen.